Chapter 6 Over the next couple of days, Michael tiptoed around Anne, treating her like she was made of glass. She supposed he had every right after her teary outburst. Really, she needed to get her emotions under control. He got her coffee. He took her for walks on the beach. He even let her go on the sailboat to have a look at it. Anything she wanted to do, he was game. She had the feeling he was afraid of another soaking from her. It needed to stop. Anne noticed the entryway light had gone out. This morning she was up and Michael was nowhere to be seen. She had a feeling he was jogging, which technically wasn't allowed yet. She was going to have to lecture him about that. The good news was that she was alone and could tackle the simple household chore without having him try to do it himself. She started breakfast since Fenley was late. Maybe it was the housekeeper's day off. Anne didn't know the woman's schedule. She just seemed to come and go, food appearing as necessary. Everything was going nicely, so she pulled the chair under the light socket. She'd managed to locate another bulb, so she got on the chair and stretched to carefully remove the old bulb. It was difficult, and she had to stretch as far as she possibly could. If she had just another inch, it would help. It took a couple of minutes, but she managed to remove it. Slipping it into her back pocket, she was on the tips of her toes, trying to get the thread on the new bulb to catch when she felt two hands grab her hips. Anne shrieked. Her heart going a mile a minute, she slipped on the chair and crashed into Michael, who had been trying to steady her. He took a step back, and she slid down the length of him. The bulb shattered on the floor. Anne found herself plastered to the man looking up at him in surprise. She leaned her forehead against his chest and took in a shaky breath. Michael, you scared me badly. Her shirt had ridden up a little and his hands were on her bare ribs. She was still wearing just what she had slept in, a pair of shorts and his t-shirt. His right thumb trailed across her skin. Anne looked up to see Michael watching her. Before her good sense could kick in, she went up on her tippy toes and kissed him. He tasted like coffee and something that was uniquely Michael. Desire unfurled in her stomach, and he kissed her back. Oh, my! Fenley was in the doorway looking at them. The overturned chair and glass scattered across the floor. What burn? Anne sniffed. The eggs! She ran to the kitchen just as the fire alarm began to trill loudly. Grabbing them off the stove, she rushed to the back door, throwing the pan and burnt on eggy mess into the sand. First time I see that, Fenley remarked to Michael. He nodded. You stay put. Bare feet in glass. I get broom. Fenley moved around him. He ignored her, picking up the chair, avoiding the glass. He used the chair to stand on, took the cover off of the trilling fire alarm cover, and yanked out the battery. There was merciful silence afterward. Could have cut feet. Fenley shook her head as she swept up the mess. Michael ignored her and went to the deck to find Anne. She was leaning against the railing, looking at the waves. The pan was in the sand below. Michael leaned on the railing and looked at the pan. It was probably a good thing he couldn't say anything. He didn't think there was anything to say about that pan that wouldn't get a man into trouble. As for the kiss, his body was still thrumming. He reached over to take her hand and she pulled away from him. He watched her with concern. Anne stared at the water. I'm sorry, Michael. I shouldn't have kissed you. It wasn't right. We can't repeat it. He reached out, but she backed away, looking brittle. Excuse me. She walked inside, and he turned to watch the waves, thinking. She had initiated it, but now regretted the kiss. She was in love with Max, so why had she kissed him? He supposed, in the moment, he might remind her of his brother. It was a depressing thought. What was she doing? He was in love with someone else, and she had practically thrown herself at him. It was embarrassing. She went to get changed into some regular clothes. As she sorted through the selection she had brought, she thought about the kiss. He was an excellent kisser. Her toes had curled, his hot hands on her ribs. She wondered if it might have gone anywhere if Fen Lee hadn't come in and the eggs hadn't burned. Her life was such a mess. She grabbed her cell phone and called L. She needed a girl's night out. Michael was bored. He had books littering the entire house, and he couldn't read one of them. He couldn't call anyone. 
What would he do? Tap Morse code. He'd already jogged today. No one was around. Fenley had a school function for one of her kids, so he was supposed to make a simple sandwich for dinner. Anne was out with the girls, and he had refused to have anyone babysit him. He wanted to be independent. He also didn't feel like having a sandwich. Driven to the television out of desperation, he idly flipped through the channels. There was no baseball game. Football was going on, but he had never bothered to watch it. He played golf. He didn't watch it. That was boring. He spent fifteen minutes on the business channel before deciding that it didn't matter. That part of his life was over. He paused on the food channel. They were going to make a steak. Steak sounded good. He had steak in the freezer, didn't he? The chef promised that it would be easy to make with step-by-step -step instructions. Well, he had done company mergers. How hard could it be to cook a steak? Michael turned up the volume and dug around in the kitchen. They were talking about spices in the background. He was pretty sure Fenley had a number of spices. He wouldn't be able to read them, but he'd give them a quick taste test. If it tasted good, he'd sprinkle some on the steak. Easy. He pulled out a frozen steak and looked at the television. His looked a little larger. They were talking of cuts of meat, and he really didn't know the difference between a T-bone or a portobello steak. Whatever. Meat was meat. They had theirs cooking already. Not wanting to get left behind, Michael pulled out a pan and set the steak in it. He put the flame on high and settled the pan on the stove. They talked about thyme and rosemary and all sorts of green little bits that looked like chopped grass. Michael carefully perused the spice rack, choosing at random, sniffing, and then tasting. One made his tongue feel on fire. He grabbed a glass of water and downed it. He threw a couple pinches of the ones he liked on, plus some salt and pepper. Who said cooking was difficult? They were going to put together some potatoes in a sauce. Hmm. Michael rummaged in the pantry and pulled out a couple of potatoes. His were much larger than the tiny ones they had on the screen. Well, he'd just have two instead of the dozen they were making. They put them in boiling water. He could do that. He grabbed a pan, filled it with water, and plunked in the two potatoes, and then sat that on the stove, cranking the burner to high. He pulled the beer out of the fridge and took a drink while he watched the host and chef gather the ingredients for the sauce. They were cutting up a tomato. He'd seen some in the fridge. He grabbed it out and got another pan on the stove. By the time he found the cutting board, they were dicing onions. They were going a little fast for him. Well, did it matter if the tomato was cut perfectly? He was just going to eat it anyway. He set it on the cutting board and then hit it firmly with a pot, causing it to flatten, juice flying. Maybe that hadn't been the best idea. He looked at the tomato and shrugged. It looked broken up to him. It was pretty much the same as dicing. He slid it from the cutting board into the pan onto the stove. He doubted he could flatten an onion like that. Grabbing one from the fridge, he wondered if the peel was supposed to be taken off or left on. Carrots? Did he even have those? He looked at the television. They were going too fast. He looked in the fridge and pantry and came up with a carrot. Grabbing a knife, he cut up the onion and carrot, tossing the pieces in the pan. They weren't as small or as nice as the chef on the television had made, but they would have to do. Wine? Michael shrugged and poured some beer on the tomato, onion, and carrot mix. Should be fine. Improvising was a way of life. Who said he couldn't be spontaneous? He had this. He poked the mixture with a wooden spoon, feeling the master of his own kitchen. Watch out, Fenley. They pulled out a plate and set a slice of lemon on it. He had lemon, but he didn't see the point of cutting out a slice for one steak. He pulled out his plate and set it on the counter. A sprig of dill? He didn't need the garnish. Michael took another swig of beer. They were talking about the chef's new cookbook. Everything seemed to be well in hand, so Michael went back to the couch and found the remote. He flipped through a couple of channels. Nothing was on. He didn't care for crime shows or daytime therapy. Some woman was yelling in Italian at another man. There was a show on fishing. He hadn't fished in ages. He used to fish off the dock with his brothers, releasing all the fish back. He had always sailed. He wondered when he would be allowed to sail again. He switched through the channels until he returned to the cooking show. They were taking the potatoes out of the water. Michael got up to rescue his potatoes. He didn't have one of those fancy scoops like they used, all mesh, but there was a scoop with some holes in it. 
He pulled the two potatoes out of the water and put them on his plate. The steak was steaming. The sauce was smoking black. The tomato, black and red, seared to the bottom of the pan. The onion and carrot stood pathetically surrounded by black. Michael grabbed the pan and put it in the sink, running water over it. Steam flew up and the smoke alarm trilled. Ears aching, he grabbed a chair, popped off the cover for the smoke alarm, and pulled the battery. The deafening trill abruptly stopped. He got off the chair and grabbed the beer, having a drink. Well, okay, no sauce. It wasn't a big deal. They were plating the steak and ooing and aahing over the plate on television. It looked good. Michael looked at his own steak. It didn't look quite right. Maybe it would taste better than it looked. Shrugging, he slid it out of the pan and onto the plate beside the two potatoes. He made sure the stove was off and shut off the gush of water in the sink now that the burned food had cooled. Grabbing a new beer and his plate, he headed for the couch to taste his feast. He cut into the steak and examined it. It looked burned on the bottom, and the top was nearly raw. Was he supposed to have flipped it? They hadn't said anything on television about doing that. He hadn't seen them do it, but then again he hadn't watched the whole time since he had been trying to find ingredients. He took a tentative bite, then spit it back out onto the plate. He took a swig of beer to get rid of the taste. There was no describing the mess of spices and improperly cooked meat. Taking a deep breath, Michael took a fork to a potato. It was rock hard. The fork was stuck in it. Michael stared at the television where the host was taking a bite and proclaiming the meal superb. They were frauds. He got up and put his plate in the sink, the potatoes rolling into the water. The kitchen was a disaster. Disappointed, he made himself a sandwich. Anne met Jeanie at their usual bar. She was surprised that Elle wasn't there yet. It had taken some convincing from Michael that she should even go, but she missed hanging out with the girls, and surely Michael would be fine for one evening without her. "'You should think about mingling more. There are some good single mixers coming up.' Jeanie took a drink from her beer. "'You won't find anyone if you don't go looking.' "'I don't have time.' Anne stirred her daiquiri. "'I almost didn't come tonight.' There's a fundraising golf event on Friday, Jeanie persisted as she crunched on a complimentary pretzel. I heard a lot of singles are going to be there. Tretton Bailey, the mayor's son, Earl Minton, he has oil money in, but he isn't great to look at. Oh, I know. George Stapleton, he owns a string of dental offices. You know how to play golf, and I've got an extra ticket since my dear Mr. Devell broke his ankle. Turns out you cannot golf in an air cast. I can't, Anne shook her head. I have to take Michael to the dentist. He has his annual checkup. Jeanie looked at her with sympathy. You're doing it all again. What do you mean? Anne asked, sipping her daiquiri through the straw. You're his caretaker. You're taking care of his appointments, his wants, his needs. You're putting him first and fretting over him. Jeanie asked the all-important question. Who is fretting over you, honey? "'Someone needs to look after him,' Anne said defensively. "'He has two brothers,' Jeanie sighed. "'Look, you quit being his secretary so that you could follow your dreams to have a family. "'Now you've just replaced the title of secretary to nursemaid. "'You're doing the exact same thing you were before and are no closer to being a wife and having children. "'If he hasn't figured out that you love him by now and acted on it, he isn't in love with you. "'He's just in love with the comfort of having you around to do everything for him.' Have some pride, and stop being his personal maid. I am not his nursemaid, Anne said without much conviction. Sure, honey. Jeanie reflected on it. No, I think it's worse. I think you're like his favorite blanket that he keeps taking around for comfort, but nothing else. Or maybe you're just his mom. His mom? Anne said, incredulous. You do everything a mom does. You've been momming him for years. Jeanie sipped her drink. I know. I got to watch the whole show. Anne put down her drink, feeling hollow inside. Jeanie was right. She had made the same horrible mistake. She was still tied to Michael, unable to take any steps to her future because of her dedication to him. She couldn't believe she hadn't seen it. She hadn't wanted to see it, she reflected ruefully. She loved taking care of Michael. 
But Jeannie was right. Michael wasn't taking care of her in return. Look, there's Elle, finally. Jeannie waved to Elle. Elle slipped into the booth. Evan was being difficult. Sorry I'm so late. No worries, Jeannie said. Elle looked at Anne in concern. Is everything all right, Anne? I've done it again, Anne whispered. I've let Michael become my focus, and I've stopped focusing on myself. Oh, Anne, Elle reached for a hand. It's understandable with the surgery and his recovery. We really appreciate the time you've put into taking care of him. Anne swallowed thickly. But it doesn't done any good. He doesn't love me. He just loves that I take care of everything, then he doesn't have to. L didn't know what to say. Jeanie flagged down a waiter, ordering drinks for all of them. Anne shook her head. I'm going to pass. I'm going back to the house. I need to think. Anne, do you want a ride? L offered. No, I'll call a cab. She fished out some money for her daiquiri. Are you sure? L asked. I don't mind driving you. No. Anne drew in a shaky breath. She felt like Elle might talk her into something, like staying with Michael, which was exactly what she really wanted to do. She just wanted to stay under different circumstances. How had she let her life become this? Dedicated to a man who only thought of her as a convenience, a friend at best. She blindly left the bar, and fortunately there was a cab waiting right at the curb. He took MasterCard so she got in. On the hour drive to the beach house, she tried to make sense of her obsession with Michael and struggled with the despair of knowing she had wasted twenty-plus years of her life hoping for something which had never happened, was never going to happen. Anne let herself into the house. It smelled like something had been on fire. She made her way to the kitchen and saw the dismantled smoke detector. Worried, she began to search the house for Michael, only to find him in the living room asleep in the leather recliner. He looked okay. She breathed a small prayer of thanksgiving, then went to investigate the kitchen. It looked like a bomb had gone off. There were spices scattered everywhere. Pans were in the sink, on the stove, on the counter. Something red coagulated on the counter and floor. There was a fork in a raw potato. What had he done? Fen Lee was going to have a fit. Anne just looked at the mess and shook her head. This was what Jeanie was talking about. Anne was a full-time caretaker. She was his wife without any of the benefits of being a wife. She slipped back into her old role of putting Michael first and her wants and desires second. She was forty years old. She wanted Michael as her husband and babies and this house. Yet he never made a move on her. He was contented letting her pick up after him, organize his life, make sure everything was good. He was comfortable. He didn't love her. He didn't want to be her husband. He didn't want to be the father of her babies. And so, if she wanted the happily ever after, she was going to have to get it elsewhere. Anne went to the living room and sat on the coffee table, watching him sleep. The ache gnawed at her. How was she ever going to get past him? Jeanie was right. She had to let him go. She had to go cold turkey. Her heart rebelled at the thought, but she didn't want to be eighty years old, full of regrets, childless, and trying to coax him to eat at the old age home. That was where she was headed if things continued like they were. It hurt. It hurt so badly to think about. Anne wiped away the tears as another sob came. She just couldn't do this any more, no matter how much she loved him. Loving him wasn't enough. He needed to love her in return, and since he couldn't, it was time to leave. She fumbled in her bag, pulled out her cell phone, and called for a cab. It would be an expensive ride back to her apartment after the expensive ride here, but there was nothing she could do about that. Michael stirred as she finished her call. He looked at her in confusion and sat up, reaching out to touch her tear-stained face, which set off another round of crying. When he tried to hug her, she pulled back, standing up, trying to get out of his reach. She wasn't going to get sucked in any more. I'm sorry, Michael, she said shakily. I can't do this any more. It was obvious that he didn't understand. He put out his hands helplessly. I can't be your caretaker, your assistant. Basically, I can't be your mom any more, she hiccuped. I'll send for my things tomorrow, but I'm going home tonight. 
Michael stood and shook his head. I already called the cab. Please don't make this harder than what it is. He motioned and grabbed those silly cards the hospital had given him. He held up the one with a question mark on it. Why? Anne asked. I am not happy here. Please, just let me go. He looked sad and disappointed, uncertain and a little lost. I'll call Elle in the morning. They'll be able to sort out your appointments and such with the day planner. Even now she was trying to take care of him. She took a deep breath. I'm going to wait outside. Please don't follow me. He watched her go to the door. Stay, he croaked the word. Puddle. Puddle stay. She gave another sob and leaned her head on the door. It took a minute to compose herself enough to look at him through a sheen of tears. Goodbye, Michael. And then she was gone. He sat down slowly, bewildered and alone. Jeanie had insisted that she go to the golf tournament, and supposed it was for the best. She needed to get thoughts of Michael out of her head and start searching for someone to be the father of her children, the husband of her life. It was time to move on, and she was determined to do her best. Jeanie had managed to introduce Anne to Earl Milton before the tournament started. He and Anne had chatted amicably for ten minutes, and then had to join their golfing partners for the tee-off. There were supposed to be cocktails afterward. They would make the effort to meet as many eligible men afterward as possible. Jeanie was man-hunting, a sport that she used to be very proficient at before she settled for Mr. Duvel. It's not like he's terrible or anything, he's just so... Anne was having a hard time describing Earl. He's like a basset hound, something you pet and then ignore. Jeanie grabbed her putter out of her bag. Jeanie! It's true, she insisted. He's not Prince Charming, but he's got good money and a sweet temperament. He agreed with everything I said. Anne shook her head and watched Jeanie sink the ball. I'm not sure I could live with someone who is constantly trying to please me. Oh, I don't know, Jeanie said. Sometimes it's good to know you'll be the one in charge. His wife, whoever her patient soul may be, will manage his life quite nicely, and he'll be eternally grateful. He's not the one for me, Anne said firmly. Jeanie put her hands on her hips. First rule, you need to have an open mind. None of them are Michael. You've been dreaming of Michael as Mr. Wright for twenty years. You're not going to be ecstatically, completely happy with anyone who takes that dream spot away from him. You need to settle for Mr. OK, I'll have babies with him. Second rule, not all the men we meet here are hanging out for a wife. You're forty. You don't have time to convince a man you're his permanent honey. You're going to have to choose from the very limited selection of those who are looking for a miss right now. Don't strike Earl off the list until you've viewed the set of candidates. There are only three, and I'm not sure Trenton Bailey is actually seriously looking for a wife. Maybe I should try speed dating, or an online site, Anne offered weakly. Sure thing. My name's Anne, I'm forty, I'm looking to get married and have babies. I think that should scare them off. Jeanie rolled her eyes. Three respectable, independently wealthy men are here right now. You can be the stay-at-home mom you want to be. We just have to get one of those men interested in you. Anne nodded. She knew Jeanie was right. You should flirt more. Stroke their egos. Jeanie lined up to take her shot at the next hole. She swung and the ball sailed away. Men like that. Is that rule number three? Anne asked dryly. Sure. They played on, and at the whole nine rest area, Jeanie introduced Anne to Trenton Bailey. Trenton was tall, blonde, tan, muscular. His perfect white smile actually sparkled. He had a weak handshake and bad breath. He also talked exclusively about himself. Since he didn't have a job or do anything of value, Anne found him rather boring. He said he was looking for Miss Wright to become Mrs. Bailey, but Anne thought he wanted someone who would make him look good, and he was probably picky. His shoes coordinated with his golf bag, something that he pointed out. It wasn't going to happen. She couldn't see Trenton with children. Children were messy, demanded attention, generally disrupted a person's social life. Trenton wasn't going to like that. He felt the entire universe revolved around him. She regrouped with Jeanie at the tenth hole. Strike Trenton from the list. I am not getting sucked into the selfish void that is Mr. Bailey. 
Don't be so choosy, Jeanie admonished. He's a hottie. He might be, but he's not dad material. Anne felt this was a valid excuse, even for Jeanie. Well, there's still Earl, as long as you can convince his mother, Jeanie grinned. Anne groaned. Are you serious? Hey, she managed Earl for forty-three years. I think she just wants the perfect daughter-in-law. Anne rolled her eyes. She didn't need a mother-in-law that wanted to share the relationship. Earl was not worth that. Not that he was on her short list. She'd have to be pretty desperate. Anne tried to concentrate on her golf game. She was an okay golfer. Jeanie was spectacular. By the time they finished the eighteenth hole, she was tired. They headed to the clubhouse to see if they could snag a few moments with George Stapleton or see if anyone else might fit the bill for what Anne wanted. A single man, ready to get married, and have children. Jeanie left to mingle with a few people and stalk the prey. Anne went to the bar and ordered a drink. She was going to need all the alcohol she could get to cope. Now, I believe I know every member of the country club, yet I am certain I have not seen you before, a man said as he sidled up to a bar beside Anne. He ordered a scotch. Anne forced herself to smile and turned to see George Stapleton. You're George Stapleton, she said a little stupidly. What were the chances? George smiled his perfect smile. You recognize me from the commercials. I'm afraid I'm at a bit of a disadvantage. Anne Schaefer. I partnered with Jeanie DeVal today for the tournament. She held out her hand, and instead of shaking it, he gave it a kiss on the knuckles. Did people still do that? Charmed. He released her hand. Put Miss Schaefer's drink on my tab, would you? Oh, no, you don't need to, Anne protested. Please allow me to, he said, taking a sip of the scotch. Do you enjoy golfing? Yes. I'm not as good at it as I used to be. I'm out of practice, she exclaimed. She could see Jeanie had spotted her talking to George and had put up her hands, two thumbs up, in the middle of an elite country club. Anne tore her gaze away from her silly friend and focused on George. Well, then, we'll have to rectify that and get you a membership here, George smiled again. He did have a nice smile. He wasn't as handsome as Michael, but he wasn't unpleasant to look at. He had minty breath. He had good financial prospects being the owner of a chain of dental offices. He was making an effort. And suppose she could do worse. A half hour of pleasant chatter later, he had her number and promised to go out next Friday night to a nice little art fundraiser for children with disabilities. It made him dad material. Anne swallowed hard and smiled. George Stapleton was on the list. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this chapter, please look forward to the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please subscribe to the channel to enjoy other audiobooks, helpful videos, and insights into writing. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.